Um, it's always a bit scary to come from the newspaper world, the old newspaper world, to speak with IT people. My newspaper is more than 140 years old. And it is correct, as you said, it has been called a regional newspaper. It, I'll update you and say it, it used to be. We are diminishing. We have lost half our staff. And uh, we have lost uh, some of the scope of people we are writing for. Instead of being the smallest regional newspaper in Norway, I would now call us the largest local newspaper. But we are not dead yet, and we are hoping that we have a bright future. Um, subscription model online is uh, giving us new hope, and uh, the sub subscription basis is increasing again. I'm not going to talk about the newspaper economy. I'm here to talk about my work as a journalist and how I discovered that I need some of the tools that you are talking about. And we have built something that I hope is interesting for more people than us. In my work as a journalist, uh, my whole life, I started when I was 18 years old, I have been using the Norwegian Access to Information Law, Offentlighetsloven in Norwegian, or Freedom of Information Act in American. Um, it provides me access to written sources, helps me to verify information, help me to prepare interviews. All good journalists use that kind of law in their own country. These laws differ a little bit, differ from country to country, but they have some of the same principles. And, and the awareness about these laws, which are a very powerful tool for journalism, is, is uh, being highlighted now by, by the United Nations with the Sustainable Development Goals. They are linking the right to access public information with the right to freedom of speech, saying that freedom of speech is less worth if you don't know what you're talking about. You need to access facts to be able to express yourself in a good and efficient way. Now, the problem is, in my country and every other country, that there is a lot of bureaucracy out there. And public institutions produce a tremendous amount of documents. And finding the document you need is, is like running around in the jungle. And, and you have no, no means of orienting yourself. You don't have a map, you don't have a compass. You, there is nothing to help you. Um, we have now around 120 countries with access to information laws. But I have discovered in no other country a, an efficient system to find the information that we actually need. We have the right to access it, but we have no way of finding out. Um, then Norway started some years ago, in the 19, 1990s, started experimenting with electronic public records, searchable public records. In, I don't know if you know what public records are supposed to, to cover, but I try to describe it as the metadata describing the information flow in any public office. All the letters coming to a public office, all the letters being sent from a public office, all the internal reports and memos constructed there and deposited in the given archive. The metadata describing this is the, what we want in the public records. And if we have tools to understand this information flow, then I as a journalist can more efficiently uh, ask for the right page on this desk, okay? It takes a long time to read through all of that. Now, to be very concrete, I'm going to take you uh, a couple of years back in time um, to a case I was working on in Federlandsvennen, my local regional newspaper in Kristiansand, south in Norway. In 1999, 
my local municipality started experimenting with electronic public records. And they built a history on this. Um, at the same year, one of Norway's richest men, property investor Torstein Tvenge, a billionaire, he bought the property next to the theater in Kristiansen. He wanted to build offices and, and apartments there and make money. Suddenly, uh, the municipality administration approached him, said, we need that property, and we're going to pay you a very low price for it, because we are expanding the theater, and you have to drop your plans, okay? He said, no, I'm going to lose a lot of money here. This is unfair. He took the municipality to court. The court ruled that uh, expanding the theater was such a good purpose that the municipality had the right to take over the property at a low price, okay? The theater, the new theater was built 250 meters away from this property, somewhere else, okay? And now the municipality want to use the same property to build an uh, office and apartment building, which was his original plan, and make money for the municipality, realizing his plan. He feels this is very unfair, okay? Now, I need to go into this story as a journalist. By 2013, we have 14 years of history on this case in the electronic searchable records, ready at my fingertips. So what happens when I want to start writing this story? It's not because of this story, but coincidentally, at that time, the municipality decides to take down their database and go back to paper. And go back to paper. No more metadata to search, okay? So if I want to make this story, I can of course be the quick and easy journalist and ask, ask the rich man how he feels about the treatment he has been subject to, and I can ask the municipality why they did this and try to balance my story, or I can insist I need to read the documents and do the fact-checking. And that is the kind of journalist I want to be. I want to do it right. I want to know what happened in the story. So, okay, I asked to see the metadata to find the documents I want to FOIA. One year of metadata printed out from my local municipality is two times my height. I need 14 years of this metadata to find, to, to start my FOIA process, okay? My news editor says, Tarje, you are a journalist. This is a PhD project. No way I'm going to allow spending that time. No way. And I complained. I'm good at complaining. I complained to my wife. Um, she gave me a cup of tea and a lot of empathy, and it didn't help. And I complained to a colleague who writes code, and I didn't get any empathy. But he asked some questions back. He said, Tarje, this metadata that you're asking for, are they always structured, structured in the same way? Tarje, have you heard about OCR software? My colleague who writes code started asking the questions that led us, after a good cup of coffee, not herbal tea, to realize that we could solve the problem. So we, <laughs> we OCR'd the public records and recreated the searchable records for my local municipality as a start, and it worked. And we decided that not only shall this be available to all the journalists that we have, it shall be available to the uh, public. So we gave it away for free, we published it on our uh, newspaper website and said you can now search the municipality public records on the newspaper website, it is for free, and if you find something fun, use it for your own good or give us a tip. 
and also our competitors started using it, and they wanted more. So a journalist colleague said, can you fix the local university? And we did, and somebody said from Oslo, well, can you fix our university as well? And suddenly we, we did all the universities, and, and we, maybe we got too inspired. But this grew far out of the local realm and became a national project. So we did it with the Norwegian church, who is also subject to the Freedom of Information Act in Norway, to all the public health corporations, to the armed forces, to the police. They phoned me and were quite angry and said, who allowed you to do this? And we said, well, it's, it's not forbidden, is it? Uh, we're just taking the public uh, records that you have to give to us anyhow and, and making them more accessible to people. Um, and there is a key to why this is possible to do in Norway. Um, these public records, or diaries, uh, as somebody called it in Sweden, my, uh, my colleague Christopher, um, or postjournaler, uh, postlistar, as, as is a term in, in some countries. Um, in Norway, they say uh, every public institution has to publish when asked for this. So what we are really doing is that we are harvesting these public records in all different kinds of format from a number of institutions, now more than 150 archives, still growing. Some of it is manual FOIA requests. Um, we subscribe to some by email. We have a web scraper that crawls pages where we can find some of them. Uh, we are using a free service uh, called the Document Cloud by investigative reporters and editors in the United States. Um, and all the documents uploaded there are OCR read with Tesseract. And then my colleague who writes code, he is writing passes for every archive, ensuring that uh, there is a tailored program script for understanding each and every source that we are including in this. The search that you uh, do in our page is done in, in our SQL database. And it gives you the list of all the, um, uh, all the um, documents that you might be interested in, and also tells you which archive it belongs to. And you can filter it by the different sources. So what's next? Um, well, we have, we have soon done Norway, uh, and, and, and we are uh, looking at expanding uh, to other countries if, if you might be interested. So um, if anybody else uh, wants to, to, to make uh, systems analyzing the data flow in public sectors in other countries, we will be very happy to, to discuss it with you. Um, the site is for free, it's no subscription. Um, this is not something that my local newspaper is making money on. We are just doing it because we can, because we feel it is right. Uh, it improves the quality of journalism, that is why we started it. It also has other uses um, in politics, in NGOs, in commercial companies. Anyone can do this. The access to information law is for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Terry. I think this, this was very interesting going on from what uh, Therese talked about data as a kind of, of instrument for navigating towards decisions. You're pretty much talking about the same thing, except sometimes you have to navigate backwards to see what really happened. And now you ran into the infrastructural problem that it was really difficult for you to get to these documents, so now you just decided to build the infrastructure yourselves. We decided that's, to fix it, yes. That's, that's pretty impressive, I think. <laughs> pretty impressive. Uh, do we have any questions uh, from, from the crowd to uh, tell you? Uh, was that a question on the front row? 
Or? Hey, um, you mentioned that you use the, your OCR software, your platform, to access uh, mostly public documents that were available but not in an accessible form. Uh, we've had a few uh, huge leaks in the past years, uh, with the Paradise Paper, Panama Papers, that require journalists to actually build really complex tools to extract the data. Have you already used, tried to use, or are you thinking of using your tools to also uh, help journalists to analyze data that is not necessarily legal to access, but actually gives valuable information to, to journalists and citizens. So leaks in... Um, well, I, I didn't quite uh, get the last part of the question. So have you used it for data that is basically leaks, not necessarily uh, data gotten through legal ways, but that provides valuable information to the public? Um, I have not been using this system for uh, other than metadata on public documents. This system we have only been using for the public records purpose. I have been involved uh, as a journalist investigating actual public documents or leaks, as you say, um, uh, in, in different journalist consortiums uh, and analyzing these documents, but then in a more closed um, working space. This, this, uh, this uh, tool that we are building here is solely for uh, metadata on public documents that, and, and only legal data. Yeah, two questions in there. I'm uh, uh, just wondering, did you get the answers about the rich uh, guy and the land uh, acquirement? Did you get to write your story after you built your Yeah, I, I got out my story. Uh, <laughs> Um, and, and, and it was as, as bad as I thought it was. The, the, um, the municipality administration had practically stolen it from him uh, and, and, and wanted to monetize on his idea. So uh, th this was actually uh, an investigative story that the rich guy benefited from. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Uh, so m my question is, um, have you considered to publish the actual papers on the websites as well, uh, and not only metadata? Well, the, the, the documents themselves, uh, that, that, that would imply me to, to file FOIA requests for all the documents, uh, which, which would create a tremendous amount of, of, of work in all the archives. Uh, it is an interesting thought, uh, but if we do it, we, we would uh, very soon run into a big problem with GDPR uh, because many of those documents might contain personal data that we cannot publish. But I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be, be, be glad to, to uh, discuss ways of harvesting some of these documents, but I don't think we can publish all documents everywhere. It, it, it might be a, a juridical, uh, difficult zone to enter. Uh, yes, Christopher Sjöholm, uh, data journalist, myself. Uh, I was wondering, for first, this is totally great. I, I, I love your work and, and, and the transparency uh, you do with, with public data. So it's a, a great source of inspiration. But uh, my, you said that the police were angry when you contacted them and put those out. How, how has the reaction been on other authorities that you have done this for and, and the people working there? The, the, the specific police district that was angry with me, there were many of them and only one got really angry. They, they had a, a, a very bad internal whistleblower case uh, at the time. So the, the, uh, <coughs> the, this uh, metadata is not about the police investigations, okay? It's metadata about police spending and police decision making. And, and they, they had a whistleblower case uh, on their leadership, which uh, you could find in this metadata, and they, had, they were afraid it might get out, and it eventually did. Uh, <laughs> um, but but uh, s some of these institutions are really happy. Some of the public health corporations are now, my local hospital, for instance, they are linking to us, saying that if you want to look at, at our public records, you have to use insyn.no because we can't do this ourselves. 
and the church were really happy. Uh, so it differs. Um, but the, the defense logistics organization, which had some severe corruption problems, uh, and, and, and the police district with whistleblower cases, they, they didn't like this. No, but it seems yeah. to be a good way anyway. So, so what I'm trying to see is really interesting is that you're shortcutting the, the system in some ways, but you're doing for public benefits. And, yeah. and, and also a lot of institutions I've seen, like in Oslo records you have, is, is really very interesting. I think man, many people here are struggling on uh, their own authorities to mm -hmm. get data out. But actually by doing this from a journalistic perspective with this kind of sources, we can we can shortcut the system and, and, and make the pressure of this happening faster because the authorities should have this, this themselves, of course, in the end. Thanks. Hello, my name is Anna. Um, I have a question about if you followed how does how did the traffic of your newspaper web page changes after you start publishing this metadata? Do you know how many users approach this metadata? Do do you have any statistics about how many people using this right now? Um, this is not a traffic magnet. Um, if, if we see an increase in traffic, and it's difficult to prove it relates, the, new, the newspaper's traffic has increased tremendously. But it could be many reasons for that. And we don't know, we can't say it is because of this tool. Um, but I believe that, that the, uh, uh, if we improve the quality of our journalism, we become more relevant to people, we get more readers. Uh, we are improving the readership and subscriptions. But the users of insyn.no, well, we have some hundred enthusiasts every week, okay? It's not a traffic magnet. But they are filing some hundreds or thousands FOIA requests every week. And, and that is doing something with the journalism. Um, so uh, a number of institutions, they become more transparent because of this tool and it is used for journalism, and it is used for other purposes. And we hope for an indirect benefit from this. I think there's one more question. Thank you. Thank you for your good presentation. So my name is Tane Lahti, and I come, yeah, yeah, I come from the city of Helsinki from Finland. And I want to highlight that actually in Finland and in the city of Helsinki, we have succeeded to release this kind of data as open data via open API as XML and, and JSON. So, and we are very proud of that. And, and actually the other cities in, in Finland, the big cities like Tampere and, and so forth, they have also done this work. So there are several cities in, in Finland that release this kind of data as open data. And, and we are very proud of that, and we are very happy to share our experiences, the best practices, and actually it's open source as well. So you are very welcome to utilize that case in your, in your work as well. Thank you. I'm glad to hear this. Yeah, and, and it's good. called actually Open Ahio API, this case, if you want to Google. Yeah. So, and, and I can tell you more during Thanks. breaks. I think this uh, last uh, comment and then some of the questions actually leads me on to a question to you, Terje. Um, because you mentioned that some um, public authorities um, say this is really good, now you, you make sure that people have better access to our public records, but you also said that one police district that were not so happy about it. Have you also had the reaction that um, public uh, authorities are a bit afraid that now they're going to be sort of swamped with uh, FOIA requests because now it's easy for people to realize mm. that there could be things that they should be asking for? It's true, and, and that is also happening uh, to some extent. Um, FOIA requests are like alcohol in many ways. Uh, if it is cheap and easily accessible, you drink more, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so if you make tools that makes it free and easy to file FOIA requests, people will do that more. And you get a more transparent society, but yes, there is extra work in the archive that follows from this. Mm -hmm. 
And I try to say to all these archivists, we are your friends. And when, if you experience extra workload as a result of this, let me write about your problems mm -hmm. so that decision makers can give you a colleague. Uh, <laughs> We, we, we need to reach out to the, the archivists in order to, to, to easen this process. Um, but yes, it is happening. I was speaking with a German and a French colleague um, uh, at Data Harvest Conference in Netherlands in June. And I'm not sure if these numbers are right, uh, but, but the, the French journalist said that on a government level, there is perhaps nine or 10,000 FOIA requests every year. And the German one said, we have surpassed 17,000. And they looked at me and said, how is the situation in Norway with only 5 million people? And I said, well, we're closing into 400,000 a year. Um, not mm -hmm. only because of Insyn, we also have uh, OEP.no, which is the uh, government uh, access to information portal that is for the governmental institutions and directorates. Um, and that has been a project that we have learned a lot from, and we are trying to cover the, the rest of the public sector, because there are thousands of public entities subject to the law and only some hundred in, in, in the government solution. And we are saying all of them should be covered by a tool like this. But that, okay, it leads to more work and more transparency. That's a good point. Maybe that's the, the good point that we should finish on. But thank you, thank you very much, Terje. I look forward to seeing you up here in the debate Thanks. after our final speaker. Let's give Terje a hand.